Hello everybody, this is David Farrell talking about music theory once again. Today we've got set theory part one. We are starting our journey into set theory. We're going to learn some new ways we can talk about pitch and harmony, some different ways we can classify these things in our music. And so let's get right into it. What is set theory? Set theory is going to be a new set of tools that lets us talk about collections of pitches. And we're going to be calling these sets here in a new way. We can use set theory to talk about any grouping of notes, any group of pitches, whether they're simultaneous, like a chord, or well, whether they're not, like a group, the group of pitches that are used in a melody, or like a scale that we, some of the things we've already been talking about. Set theory has a very, very intense focus on intervals between pitches. Set theory is really, really, really interested in the different intervals that exist between all the different members of a chord or a scale, all the different members of a set of pitches. And one of the important things about set theory is that it does not have any limits on which intervallic collections it can describe. We've run into chords that we've had a hard time putting names on, uh, whether chords that have a really diverse collection of intervals, and set theory has no problem putting a name on any grouping of our 12 chromatic pitches, and that's one of its real great advantages. Triads, you know, we can only talk about pitches that are related by thirds. We added some new categories for quartal and secundal and quintal harmony. Set theory has no limits, and that's one of the best things about it. Set theory is going to introduce us to some new language, and so let's get started by how we're going to be talking about the individual pitches that appear in a piece of music. Set theory refers to pitches by pitch class. When we use that term pitch class, we are representing every possible version of a particular pitch that could appear in a piece of music. And so that means every possible C in every octave, both low Cs and high Cs and middle Cs, and in every different part, whether it's in the piano part or the violin part or in the viola part or wherever. Set theory uses numbers to represent these pitch classes. Okay? Set theory starts on zero, and zero is C, and each half step we ascend, we add another number to that note. So C sharp is one, D is two, D sharp is three, E is four. You can see I've got them all written out here. When we get to 10 and 11, they're often represented with the letters T and E, so that we don't confuse 10 or 11 with one zero, like a, a C sharp and a C next to each other, or two C sharps, C sharp, C sharp, one one next to each other. And so I'm going to use that notation freely. These are how we're going to be referring to a lot of our pitches in set theory. We're going to be using numbers. It's going to make some of the operations we do a little bit easier, since we're going to be able to use math to help us out with these numbers. Set theory also subscribes to the idea of enharmonic equivalence. That means that in set theory, there is no distinction between enharmonic spellings of a pitch. If we see C sharp and D flat, both of those pitches are going to be labeled as one. We're not going to treat them any differently because of how they're spelled, because they sound the same. B flat and A sharp are both going to be 10. G flat and F sharp are both going to be 6. C and B sharp both 0, etc., etc. All our enharmonically equivalent notes are going to be given the same pitch class. Note that this is a little bit different from what we're used to in traditional tonal theory. Consider, for instance, the German augmented sixth chord and the dominant seventh chord. Both of these chords sound the exact same, but because they are spelled differently, they have, we treat them different, we label them different, and they function differently. C, E, G, A sharp is going to resolve differently than C, E, G, B flat. Well, we don't have to worry about that in set theory. All our enharmonic pitches are treated the same. Now that we have an idea as to how we'll be using numbers to describe our pitch classes, we can talk about intervals. Intervals still describe the space between two pitches. In set theory, we use numbers to describe intervallic space. We don't have any descriptors like major or minor or perfect anymore. All we have is a number. A pitch class interval counts upward from one pitch class to another pitch class. We always measure up from the first pitch class to the second pitch class. 
And so when we're counting, when we're describing a pitch class interval, we have to be conscious of what our first pitch class is and what our second pitch class is. This is similar to the way we're used to doing intervals from the bottom up, but here we're just always going to be careful of our order from our first pitch class to our second pitch class. And to get the number for our interval, we're simply going to subtract the number of the lower pitch class, the first pitch class, from the number of the higher pitch class, the second pitch class. And so, for example, from D to F sharp, D is our first pitch class, it's a 2, F sharp is our second pitch class, it's a 6, that interval is a 4. The difference between D and F sharp, the interval is 4. The pitch class interval is 4. From E flat to B, E flat is 3, our first pitch class, B is 11, our second pitch class, and 11 minus 3 is 8. The pitch class interval here is 8. These numbers do represent the number of semitones, the number of half steps between, and so that's a useful thing if you want to check your pitch class interval. There should be four half steps between D and F sharp, and indeed there are. Really quickly, a little chart to point out the conversions between our pitch class intervals and tonal intervals. We have those 11 intervals, 0, our perfect unison, perfect octave, 1, a minor second, 2, a major second, all the way up to 11, a major seventh. Note that I'm only using common intervals here. Because these things are enharmonically equivalent, 8 is a major 6, but 8 could also be an augmented fifth. Okay, 3 is a minor third, but 3 could also be an augmented second. We do not differentiate between seconds, thirds. We don't care how things are spelled. We just care how many semitones are between the two pitches, the two pitch classes. So this is a little chart just to help us connect what we already know to some of this new material. But what happens, what happens when we have to measure an interval like this, A up to E? If we want to use our arithmetic to measure this and we want to subtract, but 4 minus 9 is negative 5. And that's just not something that really helps us out very much, is it? To figure this out, when we have an interval that subtracts below 12, we can use our friend modular arithmetic. Yes, modular arithmetic helps us out here. Set theory uses what we call mod 12 because it only has 12 numerical values, 0 through 11, right? And so whenever we're doing math with set theory, we can add or subtract 12 to our pitch class numbers to help work through some of our set theory math. This is like adding an octave to something. Adding 12 will allow it to have the same number, it will function the same way. And so 4 minus 9 isn't a math problem that gives us a good answer. But we can add 12 to 4 using mod 12 and make it 16. And 16 minus 9 does give us an answer that makes sense. It tells us that the pitch class interval between A and E is 7. 7 semitones between A and E. And that's what I'm looking for, 7, a perfect fifth, and mod 12 can help us get there. We can keep this in mind whenever we're doing any of our math for set theory. Adding 12 or subtracting 12 can help us get our math straightened out and get our numbers where we want them to be. And that's because we only have these 12 values. We're using mod 12 arithmetic here. If mod 12 is blowing your mind, Mod 12 is something that you actually are somewhat familiar with because we use Mod 12 when we keep track of time, okay? Mod 12 kind of works like a clock. If you're trying to figure out how many hours are between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, you're doing Mod 12 arithmetic already. You're calculating 10 to 11 and then 11 to 12 and then back around to 1 and to 2. You know it's 4 hours from 10 p.m. to 2 p.m. And the same principle is at work here. We can think of our pitch class numbers almost like a clock. Here I've sort of drawn them in. I realize this is a very ugly circle, but give me a break. When we're calculating across the zero to calculate an interval, for example, 8 up to 2, we can count using mod 12 almost like a clock. If we had to calculate 8 up to 2, we would go 1 to 9, 2 to 10, 
3 to 11, 4 to 0, 5 to 1, and 6, all the way up to 2. This is sometimes a helpful aid. Drawing the mod 12 clock can be useful if you're trying to calculate your pitch class intervals across zero. Okay, so even though it seems like a new concept, modular arithmetic seems like something you've never done, it turns out it is something that you've interacted with before in your life. There is one more concept I want to talk about in this, our introduction to set theory video, and that is the idea of normal order. If we want to compare different pitch class sets, we want to simplify them. Okay? We want to get them in a format where it's easy to look at the way we talk about two groups of notes and easy to compare them with one another. The first step to getting our pitch class sets in a way that we can talk about them is to find what we call normal order. Normal order is the ordering of pitch classes that results in the smallest interval span from the first note to the last note. Normal order gets our pitches in the smallest, closest possible arrangement that they can be gotten into. That's what normal order means. Let's talk a little bit about how we're going to figure out what normal order is for a pitch class set. I've got a lovely chord here with a C, an A, a D, and a B in it, or as we would now talk about them, a 0, a 9, a 2, and an 11. The first step to finding normal order is arrange the pitches so that they fit into a single octave. You can do this in any way you want. There's more than one arrangement that'll work, and so I just chose one at random. I fit them all into a single octave. I put C, then D, then A, then B, 0, then 2, then 9, then 11. This is the first step to finding normal order. The next thing we want to do is compare the rotations of these pitches where they fit into a single octave. So I want to rotate my pitches around so that each member is the lowest note in the group. And so you can see I started with 0, C on the bottom, and then I rotated so that D was the lowest note, and then I rotated so that A was the lowest note, and then I ro rotated so that B was the lowest note. I looked at every possible grouping in which these four notes can be arranged so that they fit into a single octave. Once we have these different rotations in front of us, we can choose the one that has the smallest outer interval. Remember, we want these things to be in the smallest space that they can possibly be. And so I subtracted the number for my first pitch class from the number from my last pitch class. In my first grouping, the outer interval was C to B, and that's an 11 inter pitch in class interval, 11 half steps, pretty big. My next grouping, my outer interval went from D up to C, from 2 up to 10. Sorry, from 2 up to 0. To do that subtraction, I had to use mod 12. I added 12 to my 0. 12 minus 2 is 10, a minor 7th from D to C. My next grouping, with A as the lowest note, spans from 9 to 2. To calculate that interval, again, I had to use mod 12, because 2 minus 9 is not math that I want to do. And so I added 12 and did 14 minus 9. This interval class is 5. And finally, my last grouping from 11 up to 9. Well, 9 minus 11 wasn't math I wanted to do. So I added 12 to that 9 and made it 21 minus 11 to give me 10. So my outer intervals for each arrangement here are 11, 10, 5, and 10. For normal order, I'm looking for the grouping that has the smallest, and here, that is very easily 5, my third grouping of A, B, C, D. And just looking at this pitch class set, we can see that one is very clearly the smallest. They're all steps between those pitches. We notate normal order in brackets. As I've done here, you can see I've written out each of my pitch classes in ascending order, separated with commas. This is how we notate normal order. Here, normal order is 9, 11, 0, 9, 11, 0, 2. This is how you can find normal order. There are other methods. If you read in your book, they can give you some shortcuts. But this is one way we can do it. This way is uh, a, a sort of a long way to do it, but it will help you see all the process and all the rotations. And just like in tonal theory, the more practice we get, the better we get at doing this. Some other things that might come up with finding normal order. 
Sometimes more than one order will have the smallest outer interval. Okay, sometimes there's a tie here. I've given you a set with C, E, F, G flat, and A flat, or again, as we now will call them, 0, 4, 5, 6, and 8. And I've sort of skipped ahead here to show you that I found two different groupings that have the smallest outer interval of 8. One started on 4 and went up to 0. And I calculated that interval, again, using mod 12. 12 minus 4 gave me 8, a minor sixth as my outer interval. And then I had another version starting on C, on 0, going up to 8, going up to A flat. And again, 8 minus 0, my outer interval was 8. I'm looking for the smallest outer interval, but here I've got a tie. What am I supposed to do? When this happens, we move to the next interval in, still looking for the smallest. And so instead of going from my first pitch to my fifth pitch in these five note pentachords, I will look from my first pitch to my fourth pitch. In the first set, the one starting on four, my second to last pitch is an eight. And, the, dis and the, dis the distance there, the interval there, 8 minus 4, is a 4. If I look at my second pitch class set, the one that starts on 0, I can see that my second to last interval is a 6. 6 minus 0, that second to last interval there is a 6. Since I'm looking for small intervals, I will choose the first as my normal order, the pitch class set that begins on 4. I want the smallest possible grouping, and if they're the same on the outside, I'll move into the next note. If the next note was the same, I would keep moving in until I found a smaller interval. And so here, my normal order is 4, 5, 6, 8, 0. The result of this process is that we will have normal orders favoring pitches grouped more closely at the beginning of the set. This is an easy shortcut that is often used when we have ties, we look for the grouping that has the smaller intervals close to the beginning, rather at the end. One other outcome that can happen when we are looking for normal order is that we can find a transpositionally symmetrical set. Some sets will have the same intervals in every rotation. Let's take a look at the set I've got here, C, E, and A flat, or as we would call them, 0, 4, and 8. I can rotate these pitches in any order, but my outer interval is always the same. It's always 8. C to A flat is an 8. 4 to 0. E to C is an 8. And A flat to E, 8 to 4, is a distance of 8. And if I look at the next interval in, for each of these, it's a 4. From 0 to 4 in my first grouping. From 4 to 8 in my second grouping. And from 8 to 0 in my third grouping. These sets display transpositional symmetry. We would call them transpositionally symmetrical pitch class sets. Okay? That means every transposition of them has the same grouping of intervals. For sets like this, we can use any form for our normal order. Any of these will work for normal order. 0, 4, 8, 4, 8, 0, 8, 0, 4. All of these describe a normal order for the set. That's it for this first video on set theory. In this video, we jumped into the waters of set theory. We learned about pitch class notation, the way we talk about pitches in set theory using numbers to represent pitch classes. We talked about pitch class interval and how we're going to be calculating interval by just using subtraction of those numbers we use to represent our pitch classes. And we talked about finding the normal order of a pitch class set, figuring out how we can arrange those pitch classes in such a way that they are grouped in the smallest possible way. This is all leading towards finding a way that we can consistently compare different pitch class sets together. We've got more. There will be another video, at least one more, coming to help us figure out more about set theory, but this is a nice beginning. Please check in your textbook Check out the chapter on non-serial atonality. That is chapter 9 in your textbook, and that will help you get a better understanding of some of the properties of set theory and so show you some more examples, show you some different methods, and we will be ready to review in class. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.